Automatically, every 90 minutes. And so said Hobson, the whole Freudian story about wishes and psychodynamics and disguises and all of that is, uh, is nonsense. Um, in 1976, uh, Hobson uh, gave a lecture to the American Psychiatric Association in which he offered an alternative theory of dreams to replace the Freudian one. He said that this part of the brain, the mesopontan tegmentum, uh, where these cholinergic cells are, activates the forebrain. Uh, the forebrain, the, the mental part of the, of, the, of the brain, is activated. So we see things and hear things and think things and remember things. Um, and the, the, the forebrain joins the dots. These randomly activated neurons um, are synthesized into an experience, and that experience is the dream. Uh, Hobson's theory was called the activation synthesis theory. The causal mechanism of dreaming is an automatic pre-programmed switch, uh, which randomly switches on the forebrain, the forebrain synthesizes this random activation into an experience called the dream. But the dream is, please note, inherently meaningless. Um, it, as I said, joins the dots. It makes, to quote Hobson, it, it makes the best of a bad job. Um, the, 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 the crucial bit, uh, which I, I, I meant to say, is that for Hobson, therefore, dreams are caused by physiological, reflexive, automatic pre-programmed mechanisms. They're not caused by psychological motives, things like wishes and wants and desires. Um, you can, when you remember the dream, you can associate to that remembered dream and you can find meaning in it, uh, but the meaning is not inherent in the dream. And most importantly, the, the, the meaning is not what causes the dream. Uh, the, 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 the dream is caused by these lower mechanisms in the ponds, these automatic pre-programmed ones. So said Hobson, uh, you know, you can look at an ink blot and you can find meaning in it, uh, as we do in the Rorschach test, but the meaning is not inherent in the ink blot. Uh, you project the meaning into the ink blot. It's not actually there. Uh, uh, Hobson said that's how dreams work. The dreams are actually caused by this random activation process, and we then read meaning into them, but there is no meaning because the dreams uh, are not caused by psychological mechanisms at all. So that's where things stood uh, in 1976, and Hobson gave a lecture uh, to the American Psychiatric Association that, that, uh, outlining this theory that I've just told you about, the activation synthesis theory, and then there was a vote. Uh, and the vote was on the question of whether Freudian dream theory was still scientifically credible. And the vote went two to one against Freud, uh, which was an important moment in the history of psychiatry. It was, if you want to date uh, at what point did psychiatry shift away from these psychodynamic ideas toward a more chemical neurobiological conception, um, it was more or less then. I mean, of course, there wasn't one event that did it, but that was a that was a momentous occasion which indicated uh, the way things were going. So that was in the that was in the 70s. I came into the fray in the 80s. Um, my my research uh, in the 90s, which I began in the mid 1980s, uh, 10 years after Hobson's uh, theory was published. Um, I was a neuro and am a neuropsychologist. And uh, our view in neuropsychology is a little more sophisticated uh, a, a view of the cortex than that it synthesizes. Uh, the different parts of the cortex do different things. And so uh, my uh, hypothesis was that if you look at damage to the cortex, this is the visual part of the cortex, uh, presumably that will lead to loss of visual imagery in dreams. This is the auditory part that will lead to loss of auditory images. Uh, this is the somatosensory part uh, that will lead to changes in your body image in your dreams. This is where Broca's area is, where language is generated. Presumably, um, damage here will affect language in dreams and so on. I, I also predicted that this part of the cortex, uh, which is called the prefrontal cortex, which is the highest sort of executive office of the mind, the part that is normally in charge of your waking thoughts, um, 
this, uh, uh, given the strange phenomenology of dreams, which seems so irrational and nonsensical and illogical and certainly not goal directed, we are not in charge of what goes on in our dreams. I predicted that that part, the prefrontal cortex, uh, this part here, uh, would play no part in dreams. In other words, damage here would not affect dreams at all. So those were my hypotheses. Um, and I published my findings 10 years later in 1997. It took me 10 years to finish the study because unlike my predecessors who'd been studying cats and also rats, um, unfortunately for the rats and the cats, uh, it's ethical, it's considered ethical to remove bits of their brains and see what happens. Uh, you can't obviously do that with human beings. I needed to study human beings because I wanted to ascertain what happens to the content of our dreams uh, when different parts of the cortex um, are damaged. And uh, so you need, you need human beings who can report on the contents of their dreams uh, in order to do a study like that. And so uh, it, it took me 10 years to collect the data that I needed. Um, I studied uh, uh, 360 odd uh, patients with focal damage to different parts of the brain. Um, and I will very briefly summarize the main findings. All of those predictions uh, that I just uh, enumerated for you uh, when I showed you this slide, uh, when I said what should happen when there's damage to the visual part and the auditory part and the somatosensory part and the language part and the executive part, all of those predictions were wrong except for this one. Uh, I found that damage to the prefrontal cortex, uh, the, the dreams of patients with significant damage here and the dreams of you and me are identical. This part of the brain plays no part in the dreaming process. Everything else I got wrong. Uh, what I found however, was uh, very interesting. And I'll now tell you what it was. So this dark blue part is the bit I've told you about. That's prefrontal cortex. When that's damaged, dreams are entirely normal. They're not altered at all. Um, the next thing I want to point out is that when there's damage here uh, in the brain stem, in other words, damage here, um, what might you expect would happen? Well, REM sleep will stop. Uh, and that indeed is what happens. Uh, just as it stops in rats and cats, uh, damage here leads to a cessation of REM sleep uh, in uh, human beings. But here's the surprise. It does not lead to a cessation of dreaming. So human patients with damage here, like their animal counterparts, lose REM sleep, but they continue to report dreams. That was a very big surprise. Um, and in fact, when I found that, uh, I went back to the to the literature because we had discovered REM sleep and its association with dreams, uh, you know, a good 40 years before I reported my results. And in fact, there had never been not one single case of a human being with damage here in whom loss of dreaming had been reported. So th that was a shocker. Uh, the other really big surprise uh, was that damage to this part of the brain, uh, colored in brown here, uh, damage there did lead to a loss of dreaming, uh, but with preservation of REM sleep. So here we're talking about the visuospatial parts of the brain, the occipitoparietal regions here, uh, the back part of the brain, the perceptual part of the brain. Uh, damage here leads to a loss of dreaming with preservation of REM sleep. So please note what that means. Uh, that is what we call a double dissociation of function. Damage here leads to a loss of REM sleep, but preservation of dreaming. And damage here leads to a loss of dreaming, but preservation of REM sleep. What that means is that dreaming and REM sleep are two different things. Uh, that's what double dissociation of function indicates. The function of REM sleep is supported by this part of the brain. The function of dreaming is supported by that part of the brain, uh, and they can dissociate. Therefore, they're not the same thing. So that was a really exciting finding. Uh, nothing to do with what I was actually researching. Uh, it was just a surprise uh, that uh, uh, the, the, whatever it is that REM sleep is doing, uh, it's something that happens together with dreams, it correlates with dreams, but it's not the same thing as dreams. That we've made a fundamental mistake, uh, in fact, an undergraduate type of mistake, uh, of uh, um, uh, mistaking correlation uh, for cause, or even worse, correlation for identity.
Uh, now, it's no great surprise that damage to the visuospatial parts of the brain, the perceptual parts of the brain, should lead to a loss of dreaming because dreams are perceptual events. Uh, uh, they're hallucinations. They're things that we see and experience. So the part of the brain that generates such experiences, if it's damaged, it's not surprising it should lead to a loss of dreaming. Um, what was a surprise is that damage to the part of the brain that generates REM sleep uh, does not lead to a loss of dreams. That's why that's that's the surprise that these two things are clearly separate functions. But now I want to tell you what was much more surprising. That was the part I've marked in red. Red means important. Patients with damage to these areas on both sides of the brain, the white matter at the bottom of the frontal lobes, it's called the ventromesial quadrant of the frontal lobes. Patients with damage there, just like the ones in the visuospatial parts of the cortex, these patients too stopped dreaming. Uh, so this is the area underneath the cortex here. It's not the cortex, it's the white matter underneath the cortex here. If that area is damaged on both sides, then you have a total loss of dreaming. Uh, so that was the big surprise, and that was what I then pursued uh, in the next phase uh, of my research uh, into the brain mechanisms of dreaming. Uh, why on earth should damage to this part of the brain lead to loss of dreaming? Uh, whatever it is that this part of the brain does uh, is crucial to understanding why we dream. Um, and remember, that's the question I'm addressing with you. We didn't know why we dream. Uh, we thought that dreaming was a product of REM sleep. Uh, we didn't know why, uh, but now uh, I'd found it's not a product of REM sleep. It's something that correlates with REM sleep, but which has a brain mechanism of its own. Uh, and the question was, what is that mechanism? Maybe this will help us to understand why we dream. Um, when I looked at my patient's scans with damage here, uh, what it reminded me of, and here, by the way, are the are actual facsimiles of my patients, the ones who, who lost dreaming as a result of damage in this area. They reminded me of the fact that the, the, looking at these scans reminded me of the fact that you see damage in exactly that area uh, with an operation that used to be done decades ago called prefrontal leucotomy. I told you that the patients who lost dreaming had damage in the white matter just under the cortex here in the area that I've marked here in gray. Um, and this was precisely the area that was targeted uh, in prefrontal leucotomy. Prefrontal leucotomy was a method for treating psychosis that was used in the 1940s uh, and, 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 and in fact 50s. Um, this, this operation was used for the treatment of hallucinations and delusions, in other words, positive psychotic symptoms. Uh, it was a very radical procedure, uh, but, you know, psychosis is a very se severe illness and patients who hallucinate um, and, who, uh, and who deluded, uh, the, the, this operation uh, uh, greatly uh, diminished, uh, suppressed uh, those symptoms. So I went back to that old literature um, and I found that they had discovered decades before what I had rediscovered in the 1990s, namely that that, that operation caused a cessation of dreaming. The psychiatrists, uh, the psychosurgeons who performed that operation had observed it themselves. And in fact, they had gone so far as to observe that damage to, the, that, that, that um, uh, uh, if the patient after having this operation continued to dream, it was a bad prognostic sign. And uh, I thought, well, that makes sense because uh, dreams are hallucinations and they're delusions. Uh, so if you can still generate a dream, that means you can generate hallucinations and delusions. So no wonder uh, it was considered a bad prognostic sign. So uh, th I thought uh, that uh, I now had a, a strong clue as to what, uh, what uh, it is in this part of the brain that generates dreams. Uh, in this part of the brain, there's a circuit, which I'm now going to show you. It starts here in the ventral tegmental area, and it courses through exactly the area of that cut uh, and exactly the area that was damaged naturally in my patients. Uh, and that is, that is called the mesocortical mesolimbic dopamine system. So whereas here is the area where acetylcholine is released into the forebrain to generate REM sleep, uh, this circuit 
uh, releases another neurotransmitter called dopamine uh, into the forebrain. And this is, this my hypothesis was, this is what generates dreams. Why did I think it was this circuit? Uh, it's because, not only because this circuit is severed by the lesions we're talking about, but also because that operation, prefrontal leucotomy, was replaced by a drug, um, a drug which blocks dopamine in exactly this circuit. That's what antipsychotic medications do. Antipsychotic medications replaced prefrontal leucotomy. So my hypothesis was it's dopamine uh, transmitted through this pathway that generates dreams, and that is the mechanism of dreams as opposed to the mechanism of REM sleep. We then set about testing that. Uh, and remember, these have to be falsifiable predictions. That's what Popper's criterion was. So I predicted that if you give patients dopamine, they will dream more. And if you give them dopamine blockers like antipsychotics, they will dream less. And that's exactly what we found. Uh, if you increase dopamine, you increase the number of dreams, the length of dreams, uh, the the uh, emotional intensity of dreams, the bizarreness of dreams, uh, uh, everything about dreams is increased by dopamine and blocking dopamine does the opposite. So that confirmed uh, the hypothesis. Uh, it confirmed the hypothesis that this dopamine circuit is the one that generates the dreams. Uh, interestingly, uh, we, 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 when you do the same with acetylcholine uh, on Hobson's theory, um, in fact, the opposite of what Hobson's theory predicts uh, is what happens. Uh, if you block acetylcholine with anticholinergic drugs, you increase dreams. The, the, so it's a paradoxical, uh, um, it's, it, well, it's just, it just contradicts Hobson. So this uh, seems to be the circuit that generates the dreams. Uh, the lesions show that uh, and the pharmacological studies show that. And then this study done by my colleague Alan Brown, uh, which is a positron emission tomography study, showed the same thing using that method, that this is during dreaming sleep, that is REM sleep, 90% of the time during REM sleep you're dreaming. Uh, and he showed that the greatest area of activation um, in the brain when it's dreaming is exactly uh, in the area that I've just been talking about. Please note the prefrontal cortex, the part that I showed in dark blue over here, uh, is switched off during dreams. Uh, this part here is switched off during dreams. Uh, uh, my lesion studies showed that, and Alan Brown's uh, PET imaging showed the same thing. This part of the brain is switched on, but this is switched on like a Christmas tree. Uh, the, the part which where when it's damaged, uh, you have loss of dreaming. Uh, please also note that um, what Alan Brown's studies showed us is the other area which I showed when you have damage in the occipital and parietal, the perceptual cortex, you have loss of dreaming. And his studies showed that there is a regression of this activation onto those perceptual areas. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, so what is this circuit, uh, the, 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 this dopamine circuit, what is it doing? Uh, this, this seems to be so crucial for dreaming. Uh, the, 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 the final uh, confirmation that that was indeed the circuit, is indeed the circuit that drives dream, was these two studies. Uh, this one showed using single cell recordings, uh, this study showed that those neurons fire at their maximum rate uh, during, uh, during dreaming sleep. Uh, and this study down here, uh, using another method called uh, microdialysis, showed that dopamine is released at, a, at, the, at its terminals, dopamine is released maximally during dreaming sleep. So recording these cells shows they fire at their maximum rate during dreaming sleep. Uh, recording the release of dopamine shows it's maximal during dreaming sleep. Uh, imaging this circuit shows it's highly active during dreaming sleep. And severing this pathway shows that it's necessary for dreaming sleep. And so all of this led to the to the, to the conclusion uh, that this is indeed the pathway that generates dreams. Um, now, I want to tell you we're now in 2006, um, and Hobson and I were invited to debate uh, our respective theories. Um, just as that happened uh, in the American Psychiatric Association uh, 30 years earlier, uh, there was a vote taken at the end of our um, presentations uh, and the debate that we had. Uh, I argued that uh, we, we owed Freud an apology. I said, you know, Freud had said that this thinking part of the brain goes to sleep 
uh, but that this desire part, the unconscious, you know, sort of uh, drives and wishes and wants uh, are, are still active during sleep. And Freud said they regress onto the perceptual systems because the action systems are switched off. Uh, they regress onto the perceptual systems. And I said, you know, this looks pretty much not only does it look like what you might have expected from Freud's theory of 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 of, of dreams and and uh, that that because this activation here would normally wake us up, uh, we hallucinate our dreams. You know, all of this sort of fits with the Freudian picture. Not only that, the evidence that Hobson had found, which proved that Freud was wrong, namely that REM sleep was generated by this motivationally neutral cholinergic mechanism in the brainstem, that that theory itself was wrong. A, a REM sleep, interesting as it is, uh, is, not what, is not what causes us to dream. Or the mechanism that generates REM sleep is not the mechanism that generates dreams. So interestingly, after that uh, present, a series of presentations uh, uh, and debating between me and Hobson, a vote was taken. And this time the vote went two to one against Hobson. Uh, and Freudian dream theory in 2006 uh, at this uh, neuroscientific conference where we debated all of this uh, said that the Freudian dream theory uh, was scientifically credible after all in light of these new findings. Now it's very important uh, to note what I'm going to tell you next. Th these findings are compatible with the Freudian theory. Uh, they don't test it. Um, they, 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 they don't give, there was no falsifiable prediction arising from the Freudian theory that was tested in these studies that I've just summarized for you. Uh, all that it showed was that the, 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 the mechanism of REM sleep, which we thought disproved Freudian dream theory, that this is actually irrelevant to Freudian dream theory because REM sleep does not, the mechanism of REM sleep is not the mechanism of dreams. Dreams are generated by this other mechanism, uh, this this one uh, this one here, uh, and um, the, the the that's compatible with Freudian theory because this is a as I'm, I'm now going to show you a highly motivational system. Uh, if there's any part of the brain that's responsible for our wishes and our wants, it is this circuit. Uh, Panksepp says that uh, a stimulation of this circuit results in the most energized exploratory and search behaviors an animal is capable of. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a reward circuit. Uh, the, 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 any neuroscientist will tell you that if, if there's any part of the brain that would correlate with what Freud called these wishes and wants and desires uh, that, he, that he hypothesized, that he inferred uh, lie behind uh, the dream process, uh, then it is this circuit. Um, and uh, these, these studies show uh, that this circuit is uh, activated full blast uh, during a dreaming sleep. And considering that it normally uh, uh, motivates the animal to perform the most energized exploratory behaviors it's capable of, um, it is a disturbance to sleep. Um, and so Freud's idea that we hallucinate our dreams, uh, uh, hallucinate our wishes and wants, um, you know, these are wishes and wants, and we do hallucinate, all of that's compatible with Freudian dream theory. Uh, you can see why my colleagues voted uh, uh, two to one saying that the theory was credible, but it doesn't actually test the theory. And so I want to now tell you, and this is how, where I'm going to end my talk, uh, about a study that we are now just completing, which was designed to test the Freudian theory to finally see uh, whether we can falsify it. Uh, and this is how we went about it. We said, if this system, uh, which, which normally uh, generates the most intense exploratory uh, uh, active uh, 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 behavior uh, uh, on the basis of these highly motivated mental states, um, if this is what the brain looks like when we're sleeping, it is really surprising. I mean, how on earth do you stay asleep uh, with this intensely motivated uh, 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 activation going on. Uh, Freud's theory was the way you do it is by regressing onto the perceptual systems, having an hallucination. So my hypothesis was if we damage or if we study patients in which this part of the brain is damaged, who are unable to dream, and as I told you, there are such patients, patients with damage to the perceptual systems of the cortex, the parietal occipital regions, they still have the motivation the, the, the desires are activated during sleep, but they can't produce the hallucination. 
So these patients should wake up. If dreams protect sleep, and remember that was Freud's deepest claim, he'd claimed that because these wishes and desires are activated during sleep and cannot be acted upon because that would disturb sleep, uh, instead we hallucinate the dream and that this is to protect sleep, um, if that is the case, then patients who are unable to produce those hallucinations, but who do still have those motivations, they should wake up. They should have bad sleep. So that's my testable prediction. Um, so I took patients who had strokes, uh, strokes in this part of the brain, in the perceptual part of the brain, ox the occipital parietal regions, uh, and I compared the quality of sleep in those who continue to dream with those who no longer dream. My prediction was that the non-dreamers should have worse quality sleep uh, and the dreamers should have better quality sleep. What's nice about that prediction is it's counterintuitive. Normally you would think if you have sleep undisturbed by dreams, uh, you should sleep better. But on the Freudian theory, uh, if you're unable to dream, uh, then the thing that protects your sleep against the motivational surge um, should, uh, sh having been removed, uh, should result in worse sleep. So that was my prediction. And I'm now going to show you what we found or what we're finding because this study is not yet completed, uh, but the findings are so clear cut, uh, I don't hesitate to report them to you in their preliminary form. Before I do report those findings to you, I want to uh, reiterate the crucial point, which is that this old Freudian theory as to why we dream, uh, that which Popper famously said was not a scientific theory because it's not falsifiable, that was before we had these methods. Um, now it is falsifiable. So the crucial, the crucial thing is it is possible to test predictions uh, uh, falsifiable predictions arising from the Freudian theory. And what that's what interested me. I wanted to see was Freud right or wrong. It doesn't really matter whether he was right or wrong. The point is that we now can determine it empirically. Uh, and that's the interest in this study. So I'll now show you uh, the first few cases that I studied uh, and they were, uh, they have proven to be uh, typical. Uh, remember what I'm doing is I'm looking at patients who've had strokes Everything about them is identical, the same artery, same type of stroke, same age, same everything, but one lot of them do dream and one lot of them don't dream. So here's the very first patient that I studied, uh, the hypnogram at the top. This is, not a, this is not a cartoon hypnogram, this is a real one. Uh, so just as I showed the, in the cartoon at the beginning, uh, the, 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 the vertical axis is a level of arousal of the brain and the horizontal axis, this is time, eight hours of time. Uh, this is brain arousal. Uh, this is my first patient. So here's lights out. Uh, she has eight hours to go and she lies there absolutely awake for four hours. Then she falls asleep briefly and wakes up falls asleep briefly and wakes up, falls asleep briefly twice and wakes up and then stays awake for an hour. And then you see again, brief little moments of falling asleep, absolutely terrible sleep. Uh, so this confirms my prediction. This is called sleep onset insomnia, can't fall asleep. This is called sleep maintenance insomnia, can't stay asleep. The second patient, well, she fell asleep a lot easier, uh, but couldn't stay asleep. So again, there's sleep maintenance insomnia. And when the patient has REM sleep, goes into REM sleep, they wake up. From REM sleep, they wake up. REM sleep, they wake up. REM sleep, they wake up. So this is exactly what you would predict uh, if dreaming protects sleep. Here's the third one. Oops, sorry. I haven't, I, oh, I showed you the wrong slide. Here was the first one. This was the first one. Sleep onset insomnia, sleep maintenance insomnia. This was the second one sleep maintenance insomnia. And again, you see waking up from REM sleep. This was the third one. This was the worst one. I, I, I don't know how I jumped to that slide. I mean, this is it. This patient barely slept at all. Um, and this was the fourth one. And as I said, these are indicative. These are typical uh, of what we find. Now, here's the summary slide. Uh, here we're comparing total sleep time in dreamers versus non-dreamers. Remember, these are stroke victims. They're not well, um, so you don't expect them to sleep brilliantly. 
but there's a big statistical difference. 75% of the night you sleep if you dream, if you're a stroke victim, that is, um, and 50% of the, or just over 50% of the time if, you're, if you don't dream. So there's, there's a big statistically significant difference there. Um, we also measure sleep efficiency. This is just a, a, a complicated algorithm we use. A 20% difference in sleep efficiency between dreamers and non-dreamers. This is called an awakening index, which is the number of awakenings per hour of sleep. Uh, dreamers uh, wake up three and a half times per hour of sleep on average. Non-dreamers wake up 12 and a half times. Um, so that's in line with the predictions. Massive difference. Um, and this is an arousal index, which is measuring uh, not, not f uh, these are awakenings, but they're brief awakenings. We call them arousals. Uh, every, uh, for every hour of sleep, uh, the dreamers have 19 arousals per hour of sleep. The non-dreamers have 48 arousals per hour of sleep. And the same applies to micro arousals, which are very brief awakenings of, 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 of less than a minute. Uh, 15 and a half such awakenings, very, very brief awakenings happen in the dreamers per hour and almost 40 uh, in the, in the, in the non-dreamers. So all of this uh, confirms uh, the hypothesis um, that uh, all those years ago on the basis of purely psychological methods, sort of, sort of guesswork really, uh, Freud inferred that there's this motivational surge that lies behind dreams, that this threatens sleep, uh, and that the function of dreams of hallucinating yourself doing something that you're not really doing uh, might be, uh, the, the function of it might be to protect sleep. Uh, well, it seems uh, we really do owe Freud an apology. It seems that uh, this at least is one biological function of dreaming. Uh, there may well be other reasons why we dream, but what this study shows uh, is that one reason why we dream uh, is to help us to stay asleep. Um, I gave this lecture uh, a little while ago to another audience, and in the audience, a colleague of mine um, was attending with her little daughter. Uh, I think she was four or five years, I think she was five years old. And after the lecture, she did a drawing for her mum, which I'll now show you because uh, it summarizes my lecture for you. On the 11th of June 2020, she attended my lecture and she wrote, why do we dream? And her answer was, so we can have a good night's sleep. Um, and there you have it in summary. So thank you very much. That's what I wanted to say to you. Uh, thank you very much. Very much. Excellent talk. So let's so see let's if there are questions. Hello. Uh, very okay, interesting. Thank you. What the, the one thing that hasn't come out of this, I understand dreaming and sleep and all that, but the question of whether dreams are epitomizing what your wants and wishes are, have you solved that question? Yep. So uh, your, thank you, Glenn. Your question speaks to the point that I made earlier when I said that um, although these findings are compatible, um, with, with, with surprisingly compatible uh, with the Freudian theory, they, do, they, 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 they don't confirm any aspect of it uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a, a way that would satisfy Popper, apart from the aspect which claims that dreams protect sleep. Uh, so that's the only bit that we've directly tested uh, and, and uh, the evidence is, is strongly confirmatory that dreams protect sleep. Now, the fact that it is a surprising finding that the mesocortical, mesolimbic dopamine system, which is a major motivational circuit, it really can very reasonably be described. In fact, Kent Berridge, one of the experts on that circuit, calls it the brain's wanting system. Uh, Jak Panksepp calls it the seeking system. Um, Edmund Rolls calls it the brain reward system. It's a major positive motivational system in the brain. So to say that dreams are driven by a part of the brain, uh, a mechanism in the brain, which is responsible for desires, I think is reasonable. But that's not quite the same thing as Freud is saying. It's compatible with what Freud was saying, surprisingly compatible. But I must emphasize we haven't tested that. Um, all that we've tested is the theory that dreams protect sleep. Earlier in the week, we heard how sleep was so essential for one's health. Now, these non-dreamers, their lack of sleep, did it lead to deterioration in their general health and well-being? Yes, so 
Uh, first of all, um, what I must tell you, which I haven't yet uh, had reason to tell you, is that most non-dreaming patients recover. Uh, they recover, and in fact, this was a major uh, frustration uh, to us in conducting our study, uh, that uh, the, in the acute phase after the stroke, uh, the patients uh, uh, lose the capacity to dream, uh, but within weeks and months, they recover. So, so we gradually learnt in our study that we have to catch them quickly um, and, and get them into the sleep laboratory before they recover, which is good for our study, but bad for them, of course. It's good news for them uh, that they do recover. So uh, there are very few patients uh, in which this is a chronic uh, condition, uh, the, the loss of dreaming. Uh, in those few patients in whom it is a chronic condition, this is one, this is one of the follow-up things that we're looking into right now. Um, we're looking into the, the um, uh, potential uh, uh, health consequences of these patients not being able to dream. Uh, so you're quite right. I mean, not being able to dream means not being able to sleep, and uh, poor quality of sleep has enormously deleterious effects on our health. And that's something we're looking into in relation to that minority of patients in whom there's a long-term cessation of dreaming. I just want to go to the comments quickly. Taylor Surf, my partner always struggles to remember his dreams. Could you explain this to me? Um, well, in fact, it is quite normal uh, not to remember dreams. Um, the, if you think about it, it's probably just as well, uh, because what you're dreaming uh, is, is not real. So if you couldn't uh, you know, distinguish between real events and dreamed events, uh, you'd be in trouble. So it's a good thing that uh, we don't remember these apparently real events uh, uh, when we wake up. Um, that's the norm. Uh, where, uh, that, that's what happens with dreams. Um, but if you wake people up, even people who say they never dream, um, and many people claim that they never dream, uh, if you wake them up during REM sleep, when, as I told you at the outset, 90% of the time you're likely to be dreaming, uh, you find that they dream uh, uh, just as much as, as you and I do. So um, it's, it's, it's not unusual. It's not an abnormality uh, for somebody who says they don't remember their dreams. Um, and if you want to, I can tell you, well, I will tell you quickly, your partner, if, 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 if he or she wants to remember their dreams, uh, this is what they must do. Uh, when they wake up, first of all, they mustn't wake up with an alarm clock. Uh, so if they have to get up and go to work, uh, they should do this on the weekends. Uh, you must wake up naturally. Uh, then when you wake up, don't jump up. Keep your eyes closed, lie still and think, what did I dream? Uh, then, then tell the dream to yourself in words uh, and give it a title. The dream about the funny man who gave a lecture. Uh, and then you can open your eyes and get up. Uh, that's the best way to remember dreams. Don't use an alarm clock. Uh, before you open your eyes, uh, ask yourself what you dreamt. Tell it to yourself in words. Give it a title, uh, and then you'll you might have a much much better chance of remembering it. If you are taking sleeping tablets, like somebody I know took sleeping tablets. It seemed to take all his dreams away. He never dreamt with the sleeping tablets. Could that happen? Yes. So um, I, 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 I don't want to overgeneralize and uh, uh, it's dangerous to do so. But uh, let me just say uh, to anybody in the audience, if you are taking hypnotic sleeping uh, pills, uh, I hope that you're doing so for a very, very good reason. Um, and I hope that you're doing so only ever so briefly because uh, hypnotics wreak havoc with sleep, um, uh, and uh, uh, and indeed what you've just said is true. They wreak havoc with dreams too. Uh, so sometimes we need to, for a short, sharp shock, uh, we need to take uh, sleeping pills, but they should never be used chronically. They're very bad for sleep, uh, and they're addictive. In other words, we habituate to them. So uh, the person you know who's, who's taking them, uh, the, the, the effect it's having on their dreams um, is, is, uh, is, is, is the norm. Uh, and uh, it also has, has bad effects on the structure of sleep altogether. And that they should be used very, very sparingly. So Mark, do you have some good tips for people who can't sleep and not take pills? Yeah, yeah, you know, there are, there are surprisingly successful um, behavioral interventions. 
So the people who can't sleep, uh, the, the first line of treatment is sleep hygiene, just teaching people some basic things about sleep. Uh, um, and, and it's amazing how, um, how, um, how much of a difference that makes. Uh, so simple things like um, sleep in a room that's well ventilated, that's not too hot, that's not too cold, uh, that where there's no light, uh, in other words, no mobile phones or computers or anything. Um, and, uh, the, uh, you know, you, you, blankets and, and pillows and all of that must be comfortable. But just these absolutely commonsensical things. No light, no sound, good oxygen, uh, good temperature, uh, comfortable bed and pillows, uh, and uh, go to sleep at the same time roughly every night. Uh, don't read in bed, don't watch television in bed. When you go to bed, it's for sleeping. Uh, do those other things somewhere else. Uh, all of that makes an enormous difference. There, there's, there's several programs, behavioral programs, uh, that are freely available on the internet. Uh, just look, uh, look up sleep hygiene tips uh, and you'll find several programs and the results are, are really good. Let me add to the sleep hygiene tips. No tea or coffee. Uh, no tea or coffee after mid-afternoon. Uh, wine is a good thing in moderation. Um, if you drink a lot, uh, it, all, it, it, it leads to sleep fragmentation, uh, but, but, but a, a, a little dop is not a bad thing at all, Espe especially helps with sleep onset and then it has no effect uh, on, on, the, on the structure of sleep uh, over the night. Uh, just, a, just a personal question, which I wanted to ask all the, the speakers, is how they came to be interested in sleep. I mean, your own, for your own experience, did you start off being interested in the brain and then move to sleep or how, what is your own sort of evolution? Well, um, the, uh, uh, in my case, uh, I, I trained in the early 1980s uh, and uh, the reason I was interested in the brain, uh, which I would have thought is the obvious reason why anyone would be interested in the brain, because unlike any other organ, uh, it feels like something to be a brain. The brain is a sentient being. It's, it's miraculous. It's incredible. How can it be, you know, that, that I am my brain? Uh, so this is what led me to want to study not only neuroscience, but also neuropsychology. In other words, the mental aspect of neuroscience. Uh, and yet when I trained, there was very little psychology in neuroscience. Um, you know, we, we learned about all the functions of, uh, you know, the mechanisms whereby memories are laid down and the way that language is organized in the brain and the way that, you know, perception and skilled movement and so on work mechanistically. But why there is something it is like, uh, why we experience, why we feel, uh, how the brain can possibly be the person, all of that was was not only left out. When you ask your professors questions about these things, they would say, don't ask questions like that, bad for your career wasn't proper science. So the, the, the one bit of consciousness that was a respectable topic in the 1980s was the mechanisms of sleep and, and, and wakefulness. How, how, we, how we fall asleep, how we wake up, what the brain mechanisms are for all of this. That was, that was the only way you could study consciousness in the 1980s. So I was interested in consciousness. Uh, and so that's why um, through, the, through the back door of sleep, I was able to study dreams, uh, which is which is of course a proper psychological topic. Um, so that's my answer. Thank you, thank you for this wonderful lecture, and thank you everybody for joining us and for staying with us for the week. Pleasure, great pleasure. <laughs>